Hi, uh, I'm Peter Fields, and here is our good friend, Moffitt Librarian Ryan Samuelson. And we're trying to answer that question, why Lovecraft? Why the weird? So many weird authors. If we're talking about Weird Tales, the magazine, they've been lost in the mists of time. So many authors. And one or two of them we're going to bring back from the obscurity in this course. But why Lovecraft? A problematic figure in many ways. But one reason, one answer to the question, why Lovecraft, is important writers will not let us forget him. People, fantasy writers like Neil Gaiman, okay, horror writers like Stephen King, they won't let us forget him. And uh, we're going to uh, culminate our course uh, with with selections from Lovecraft Country, which became um, a, a, a television series on HBO, and um, at the back of at the back of my volume of Lovecraft Country, uh, Matt Ruff pays tribute to Lovecraft, and in particular, the story that Ryan and I are going to be talking about today, the Shadow over Innsmouth. In a way, the most perfect. H.P. Lovecraft's story, the one most indicative of everything he does. And here is what, I'm, I'm reading aloud from Matt Ruff, here's what Matt has to say. The story that best sums up Lovecraft, for me, says Matt Ruff, is a shadow over Innsmouth. It's about a New England town, coastal town, whose inhabitants made an unholy, an unholy alliance with aliens who live in the sea. A tourist comes to Innsmouth for the day, sees too much, and ends up running for his life. All of Lovecraft's worst traits are on display in the story. Besides his standard racist worldview, Shadow over Innsmouth offers a thinly veiled allegory about the evils of miscegenation. The aliens are mixing bloodlines, that is, mating with the townspeople. But as a tale of steadily mounting dread, the shadow over Innsmouth works. And it's one of the most effective portrayals of attempted lynching I've ever read. Lovecraft's protagonist is white, but with just a few changes, this could easily be the story of a black traveler caught in the wrong place after dark. So for all his faults, Lovecraft was tapping into these universal themes of horror that resonate even if you're not a white separate. Oh, even if you're not a white supremacist. I wish he had been a better person, says Matt Ruff, or blessed with better mentors, but as a storyteller, I can still learn from him. And that's one of the things I want. we need to talk about. We need to recognize the fact that Lovecraft as a person wasn't a nice person. He was, again, a, a, a very racist in, individual, he was uh, a follower and in, in believed strongly in European fascism. He didn't live to see World War II, but he was a strong follower of people like Mussolini and Hitler. Um, he was a huge anti-Semitic as well. And yet there are, it's interesting at the fact that he, he, again, he was a very complex person. He was a very loving person. He was a very encouraging person to the peers around him, very helpful uh, he was a man who would donate tons of time to help anyone he could. Uh, he was a man who, despite being an anti-Semitic, married a Jewish woman. There's a story we're not reading this year that we've read before in the past for this class, which is the Shadow Out of Time, which is a, which is which is one of the last stories he wrote. And it's interesting because the Shadow Out of Time seems to be saying seems to be complete a complete reversal of racism. It seems to be saying that those weird alien creatures, those weird monstrosities that we're talking about, they're just people like us. And so again, there's a, there's a strange complexity to Lovecraft. He's he's a very interesting writer in the fact that he he seems he he, he espouses these racist views. And a lot of times his race his, his his writings seem to reverse that or seem to seem to seem to follow back on that and say, no, we're all just people to, to some extent. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, the, the Shadow Over Innsmouth is, in a sense, the most perfect story in terms of the disinterested narrator. The narrator, uh, the narrator seems to have, at the beginning, no particular relationship to anybody in Innsmouth. 
But what gradually unfolds is that our disinterested outsider narrator is actually an insider. He, like the denizens, like the, the citizens of Innsmouth, he belongs to that lineage, that, that mixing of human and alien. And the alien we're talking about, the alienage that is at stake here, is that of a kind of fish people, the deep ones. These are people who belong to that alien history, that alien primordial history, and their civilization has continued at the bottom of the sea, underneath a reef off the coast of Innsmouth. And if you're wondering, yes, further writers developed, developed this idea, and they tied in Raleigh from the Call of Cthulhu into In With the Deep Ones and things of that nature. So this idea of sunken cities and people living below the sea, these are all, these, all these ideas begin to tie together later on in the Cthulhu mythos. Um, the Shadow of Innsmouth, again, starts off as, by the way, this was um, published as an actual uh, novella. Unlike a lot of the stuff, this was um, this was actually published as a novella during his lifetime, that which actually had illustrations and 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 um, again it, it it was it was it's a longer work and it's a work that he he viewed that to stand on its own, not necessarily to be published in something like Weird Tales, um, and that's very interesting because it is it is a mystery story. Again, that one of the popular things that Lovecraft loves to do is is have that mystery story. But again, what Lovecraft does differently than like what Poe would do or what Sir Arthur Conan Doyle would do is of course, the character thinks that they are a, that they are an outsider, as Peter says, looking in on trying to figure out this mystery. And what do they find out? What, what do they find out from the mystery? They find out that they are the murderer, that they are part of the problem, that they are the, 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 the answer to the question that they are searching for. Um, now, the, the first the, uh, the first person we hear from, the first person the disinterested narrator uh, interviews and chronicles is the ticket agent. And the ticket agent, the ticket agent uh, tells the story of Innsmouth. And in particular, he is the, the ticket agent is trying to account for why why people tend to steer clear of Innsmouth. For instance, Joe Sargent is the bus driver, okay, the Innsmouth bus driver, and there's something wrong with Joe Sargent. And what the ticket agent is trying to do is account for why Innsmouth is a strange place that everybody avoids. I'm, I'm on page uh, 271, and why is everybody so down on on Innsmouth? Why is everybody so down on them? Well, young man, okay, you mustn't take too much stock in what people say, okay? I'm from Vermont, and I don't, I don't put much stock in what I'm hearing and all the rumors. And then, of course, what does the ticket agent do? He conveys those rumors, and they're oddly compelling. For instance, on page 272, Something to keep in mind, especially in terms of miscegenation, racial mixing, mixing of the bloodline. Okay, in the middle of 272. But the real thing behind the way folks feel, the way they talk, is simply race prejudice, says the ticket agent. You have to understand what's going on here is old-fashioned racism. The way people treat the people of Innsmouth, the way they feel about Joe Sargent, it's just prejudice. I'm not even saying there's it's it's all that bad. Notice he says that. And I don't say blaming I don't say I'm blaming those who are prejudiced. <laughs> okay, but that you have to understand what we're talking about is racial racial prejudice. I hate those insmuth folks myself. I, I feel it myself. I don't even care to go to their town. Okay, I I don't, all right? I suppose you know, though I can see you're a Westerner by the way you talk, what a lot of our New England ships used to have to do with queer ports in Africa, Asia, South Seas, places where maybe 
maybe New England ship captains and New England sailors mingled with, racially mixed with other races. Maybe, says the ticket agent, that's the best way to understand why everybody talks about Innsmouth. And the, and the ticket agent says, and why I myself feel some of this, even though I know it's just old-fashioned racial prejudice. And this is a very interesting uh, point of view on the part of the ticket agent, because what is Lovecraft doing, okay? He's deconstructing, he's destabilizing racial racial prejudice that's fundamentally unreliable. It's a form of ignorance, and you shouldn't pay any mind to it, except to this extent. Racial prejudice is one way modern people express their misgivings, their suspicions, their sense of dread of something larger and older than what our conventions, what our conventional common sense otherwise uh, has to say. And again, it's it's interesting. Lovecraft was a very interesting individual. Let me put it that way. Um, it's it's very easy for people to simply just say, "Oh, he was just a racist writer, and his 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 writings not not worth us reading." But as as we can see, what Peter and I are trying to say is, no, there is something worth worth um, getting out of by reading Lovecraft. And what more is, you can pull actually anti racist messages out of his writings if you really look, which is which is odd for a man who was a self self confessed racist. So, and and on two seventy four, <laughs> uh, the ticket agent right in the middle once again uh, apologizes. Uh, for the way people treat the people of Innsmouth. He once again says, you know, it's really kind of unfair the way everybody talks about them. Uh, in the middle of 274, I guess they're what they call white trash down south. I think that's what people think about the people of Innsmouth. And we're only talking about a handful of people these days, maybe a few hundred people, okay, in this town that used to have many thousands, okay, this once upon a time thriving coastal community okay and everybody today just treats them and it's unfair treats them like white trash and again again racial prejudice what is prejudice what is racism okay it, racism lovecraft is suggesting in the shadow over insmith is a vague intimation it's a form of ignorance that is bliss remember modern people hang on to ignorance we hang on to belief systems that protect us from what we dread from larger truths and the ticket agent is saying there is some kind of awful truth between the lines of insmith but all we really have to go on is racial prejudice and a kind of a kind of unfair view of insmith people as Oh, what they would call down south white trash. Okay. And again, that's also reinforced when he talks about the great families of the um uh of 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 Innsmouth, the marshes in particular, uh, but also the Waits, the Gilman, the Elliots. This idea that um what, what Lovecraft is alluding to here is this idea of of that white supremacists have of about keeping the blood pure. And he's also contradicting that with the idea of inbredness, of, of this, this thing that if, if, if rich people keep the blood pure, we view it as something good. We view it as something like, oh, they've kept the bloodline pure. They've kept the, the royal family, you know, it, 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 they're only marrying within their station and things like that. Yet at the same time, if, if, a, if a Kentucky uh, Appalachian family does it, we say, oh, they're just inbred hillbillies. And so and isn't they, that unfair? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's that's not fair because the truth is, Lovecraft is suggesting our prejudices are a form of willful ignorance, a kind of unspoken agreement or social contract that protects us from the truth, and that is that primordial history. Now, what if a white supremacist? presides over a cult of white supremacists, but then persuades them to commit the cardinal sin of miscegenation. <laughs> what if the only recourse for a good old-fashioned racist 
is racial mixing. Remember, we have a character uh, uh, and um, page, I, I'm looking at page, uh, uh, at page 277, the story of Captain Obed Marsh. Okay, and Captain Obed Marsh is that ship captain who makes an awful, awful, well, I'm using awful as in the terrifying, <laughs> awesome sense of what the word awful means. He makes an awful compact. He makes an alliance with the Deep Ones. Awful slash awesome, yes. He encountered island people who had made a similar alliance, and they benefited from it. They had unlimited fishing, okay, and precious, precious metals and treasure. That's the only hope for Ensmith. That's the only future it has. And uh, I'm reading from the bottom of 276 on to page 277, okay? At the very bottom of 276, the patterns all hinted of remote secrets at the top of 277 and unimaginable abysses in time and space. And the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. We're talking about jewelry. We're, we're talking about jewelry which speaks to the Deep Ones, the jewelry of the Deep Ones. Okay. All, among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ecthetic and half Batrachian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive function are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times I fancy that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs represented in this jewelry, okay, were overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. Such was the alliance that Old Man Marsh, Captain Obed Marsh, and his sailors made once upon a time to save Innsmouth and give it a future. And it's miscegenation between human and deep one. Remember, these aliens from another world with different, with different rules, they have continued their civilization at the bottom of the sea. Off, off the shore of Innsmouth. And the jewelry, the jewelry in the museums of Innsmouth, okay, it obviously speaks to a race of people who are fish-like. And they are abominations in a sense, but their bloodline has mixed with the people of Innsmouth and what, what the narrator ultimately learns is that young people look very human. It's only in their old age that they start to look like their true racial inheritance. They start to look like the fish people. What I think is interesting also is all of this is laid out very early in the story to some extent. And yet the narrator, as you said, there's that willful ignorance he keeps refusing to believe any of these stories. Oh, these are interesting little tales that he keeps hearing about and stuff like that. It's not until um, much later in the story where he actually sees sees the the cacophony of of people as they're marching through the streets of of all the inhabitants of Innsmouth that he finally begins to believe that it's true. Yes, um, he has a he has a. He has his own peculiar family history, which is suggestive. And yet, yet we sense that he's repressing the obvious implication that he himself could be, could be, uh, just like one of the young people in Innsmouth, he could be somebody who for now looks ordinary, but whose destiny whose destiny is 
among the deep ones under the waves of the sea. And the way the story ends, it reminds us of that awful Pentecost, okay, those apostolic flames, that larger cosmic belonging at the end of Color Out of Space. The, this, the, way, the, uh, the way the story ends is, in many ways, empowering. It's an empowerment model. He is, he discovers that the thing that he most dreaded, that he might be just like the people of Innsmouth, okay, he himself may someday look like Joe Sargent, who looks like a fish, who has all the characteristics of a fish. Okay. He has a destiny which is immortal. He could, he could rejoin that civilization at the bottom of the sea and live forever. And we come full circle. We started with the outsider and we end with the outsider. Again, we end with the person who comes to a, to a, a revelation about who they truly are. And the question is, is it dreadful? Yes. But do they ultimately accept it and become much a much happier and a much more better off person? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Because our conventional notions, our conventional religious and social mores, they're but intimations. They are veils through which we glimpse a larger truth. How about racial prejudice? The kinds, the kinds of things that divide people. Those two are veils through which we have intimations of a larger truth. And that larger truth, that larger truth is that we belong to a primordial, a primordial people whose rules are different from those of conventional experience and conventional religion and conventional reality and conventional science. We belong to another world. And this world is immoral. And this world is our true selves. These are our true selves, who we were truly meant to be. So it's interesting, again, a lot of people view Lovecraft as a very racist writer, and yet he is espousing these ideas that racism is just like the existential horror views humanity as unimportant and very small. So too does it view things like race and hatred and racial segregation and racial hatred and racial supremacy. It views those things as very small and also very inconsequential. And I think we'll leave it there and we'll pick, see you guys next time. I believe we're going to move on to Arthur Macon next, um, who was one of the um, influences of H.P. Lovecraft. One of H.P. Lovecraft's favorite writers, Arthur Macon, and we'll, we're going to be looking at his story, The White People.